Titan's exploits. Of all, all of those many feats and marvels, the struggles and wanderings of Whale's son. Things unknown to anyone, except to Fatal, Fight, Fatila, Fight, Fitla. Things unknown to anyone except to Fitla, feuds and foul doings, confided by uncle to nephew when he felt the urge to speak of them. Always they had been partners in the fight, friends in need. They killed giants, their conquering swords had brought them down. After his death, Sigmund's glory grew and grew because of his courage when he killed the dragon, the guardians of the horde. Under gray stone, he had dared to enter all by himself to face the worst without Fytala, without Fytla. But it came to pass that his sword plunged right through those radiant scales and drove into the wall. The dragon died of it. His daring had given him total possession of the treasure hoard, his to dispose of however he liked. He loaded a boat, whale's son, waited her hold with dazzling spoils. The hot dragon melted. Sigmund's name was known everywhere. He was utterly valiant and venturesome. A fence round his fighters and flourished therefore after King Haramod's prowess declined. And his campaign so slowed down. The king was betrayed, ambushed in Jutland, overpowered and done away with. The waves of his grief had beaten him down, made him a burden, a source of anxiety to his own nobles. That expedition was often condemned in those earlier times by experienced men who relied on his lordship for redness, for redress, who presumed that the part of a prince was to thrive on his father's throne and defend the nation, the shielding land where they lived and belonged, its holdings and strongholds. Such was Beowulf in the affliction and the affection of his friends and of everyone alive. But evil entered into Haramod. They kept racing each other, urging their mounts down sandy lanes. The light of day broke and kept brightening. Bands of retainers galloped in excitement to the gate hall to see the marvel. The king himself, guardian of the ring horde, goodness in person, walked in majesty from the woman's courts with a numerous train attained by his queen attended by his queen and her crowd of maidens across to the mead hall. When Hrothgar arrived at the hall, he spoke, standing on the steps under the steep eaves, gazing toward the roofwork and Grendel's talon. First and foremost, let the Almighty Father be thanked for this sight. I suffered a long harrowing by Grendel, but the Heavenly Shepherd can work his wonders always and everywhere. Not long since, it seemed I would never be granted the slightest solace or relief from any of my burdens. The best of houses glittered and reeked and ran with blood. This one worry outweighed all others. A constant distress to counselors and thrall and entrusted with defending the people people's forts from assault by monsters and demons. But now a man, with the Lord's assistance, has accomplished something none of us could manage before now. For all our efforts. Whoever she was who brought forth this flower of manhood, if she is still alive, that woman can say that in her labor the Lord of Ages bestowed a grace upon her. So now, Beowulf, I adopt you in my heart as a dear son. Nourish and maintain this new connection, your noblest, you noblest of men. There will be nothing you'll want for, no worldly goods that won't be yours. I have often honored smaller achievements, recognized warriors not nearly as worthy, lavished rewards on, less, on the less deserving. But you have made yourself immortal by your glorious action. May the God of ages continue to keep and requite, requite you well. Beowulf, son of Ecthiel, spoke. We have gone through with a glorious endeavor, and being much favored in this fight we dared against the unknown. Nevertheless, if you could have seen the monster himself, where he lay beaten, I would have been better pleased. My plan was to pounce, pin him down in a tight grip, and grapple him to death, have him panting for life, powerless and clasped in my bare hands, his, bloody, uh, his body in thrall. 
but I couldn't stop him from slipping my hold. The Lord allowed it. My lock on him wasn't strong enough. He struggled fiercely and broke and ran. Yet he brought his freedom at a high price. Yet he bought his freedom at a high price, for he left his hand and arm and shoulder to show he had been here, and a, whole, a cold comfort for having come among us. And now he won't be long for this world. He has done his worst, but the wound will end him. He is hasped and hooped and hip purpling with pain, limping and looped in it. Like a man outlawed for wickedness, he must await the mighty judgment of God and majesty. There was less tampering and big talk then from Unferth the boaster, less of his blather as the hall thanes eyed an awful proof of the hero's prowess, the splayed hand up under the eaves. Every nail, claw, scale, and spur, every spike and welt on the hand of that heathen brute was like barbed steel. Everybody said there was no honed iron hard enough to pierce him through, no time-proofed blade that could cut his brutal, blood-caked claw. Then the order was given for all hands to help to refurbish Herod immediately, men and women thronging the wine hall, getting it ready. Gold threads shone in the wall hangings, woven scenes that attracted and held the eye's attention. But iron braced as the inside of it had been, that bright room lay in ruins now. The very doors had been dragged from their hinges, only the roof remained unscathed. By time the guilt-fouled fiend turned tail in despair for his life, but death is not easily escaped from by anyone. All of us with souls, earth dwellers, and children of men must make our way to a destination already ordained, where the body, after the banqueting, sleeps on its deathbed. Then the due time arrived for half day and sun. <sighs> then the due time arrived for half day and sun to proceed to the hall. The king himself would sit down to feast. No group ever gathered in greater numbers or better order around their ring giver. The bench was filled with famous men who fell to with relish. Round upon round of mead was passed. Those powerful kinsmen, Hrothgar and Hrothulf, were in high spirits in the raftered hall. Inside Herat there was nothing but friendship. The shielding nation was not yet familiar with feud and betrayal. The half Dane's son presented Beowulf with a gold standard as a victory gift, an embroidered banner, also breast mail and a helmet, and a sword carried high that was both precious object and token of honor. So Beowulf drank his drink at ease. It was hardly a shame to be showered with such gifts in front of the hall troops. There haven't been many moments, I am sure, where men exchanged for such treasures at so friendly a sitting. An embossed ridge, a band lapped with wire, arched over the helmet. Head protection to keep the keen ground cutting, keen ground cutting edge from damaging it when danger threatened, and the man battling behind his shield. Next, the king ordered eight horses with gold bridles to be brought through the yard into the hall. The harness of one including, included a saddle of sumptuous design. The battle seat or the son of Halfdane rode when he wished to join the sword play. Wherever the killing and carnage were the worst, he would be to the fore, fighting hard. He would be to the fore, fighting hard. Then the Danish prince, descendant of Ing, handed over both the arms and the horses, urging Beowulf to use them well. And so their leader, the lord and guard of coffer and strong room, with customary grace, bestowed upon Beowulf both sets of gifts. A fair witness can see how well each one behaved. The chieftain went on to reward the others. Each man on the bench who had sailed with Beowulf and risked the voyage received a bounty, some treasured possession. In compensation, a price in gold was settled for the Geat Grendel. Was settled for the Geat Grendel had cruelly killed earlier, as he would have killed more had not mindful God and one man's daring prevented that doom. Past and present, God's will prevails. 
Hence understanding is always best, and a prudent mind. Whoever remains for long here in this earthly life will enjoy and endure more than enough. They sang then and played to please the hero, words and music for the warrior prince, harp tunes and tales of adventure. There were high times on the hall benches, and a king's poet performed his part with the saga of Finn and his sons, unfolding the tale of the fierce attack on Friesland, where Naif, king of the Danes, met death. Hildbur had little cause to credit the Jutes. Son and brother, she lost them both on the battlefield. She bereft and blameless, they foredoomed cut down and spear gored. She, the woman in shock, waylaid by grief. Hawk's daughter, how could she not lament her fate when morning came and the light broke on her murdered dears? And so farewell, delight on earth, where car was war carried away, Finn's troop of thanes, all but a few. How then could Finn hold the line, or fight on to the end with Hanks? How save the rump of his force from that enemy chief? So a truce was offered as follows. First, separate quarters to be cleared for the Danes, hall and throne to be shared with the Fr Frisians. Then second, every day, at the dole out of gifts, Finn, son of Falkwald, should honor the Danes, bestow with an even hand to Hengst, and Hengst's men the wrought gold rings, bounty to match the measure he gave his own Frisians to keep morale in, his, in the beer hall high. Both sides then sealed with agreement, with oats to Hengst, openly, solemnly, that the battle survivors would be guaranteed honor and status. No infringement by word or deed, no provocation would be permitted. Their own ring-giver, after all, was dead and gone. They were leaderless and forced allegiance to his murderer. So if any Frisian stirred up bad blood with, his, with insinuations or taunts about this, the blade of the sword would arbitrate it. A funeral pyre was then prepared, effluent gold brought out from the hoard. The bride and prince of the shieldings lay, awaiting in flame. Everywhere there were blood-plastered coats of mail. The pyre was heaped with boar-shaped helmets forged in gold, with the gashed corpses of well-born Danes. Many had fallen. The hidden burr, the hilled burr, ordered her own. Then hilled burr ordered her own. Son's body be burnt with knaifs, the flesh of his bones, to sputter and blaze beside his uncle's. The woman wailed and sang keens. The warrior went up, carcass flame, swirled and fumed. They stood round the burial, the burial, as heads melted, crusted gashes spattered and ran, bloody matter. The glutton element flamed and consumed the death dead of both sides. Their great days were gone. Warriors scattered to homes and forts all over Friesland. Few are now feeling loss of friends. Hanks stayed, lived out that whole resentful blood sullen winter with Finn, homesick and helpless, no ring world prow, could up then and away on the sea. Wind and water raged with storms, wave and shingle were shackled in ice, until another year appeared in the yard as it does to this day. The season's constant, the wonder of light coming over us. Then winter was gone, earth's lap grew love. Earth's lap grew lovely, longing woke in the cooped up exile, for voyage home, but more for vengeance, some way of bringing things to a head. His sword arm hankered to the greet, to the greet of Ju to greet the Jutes. His sword arm hankered to greet the Jutes. So he did not balk once Hunlething placed on his lap, dazzle the duel, the best of all whose edges Jutes knew only too well. Thus blood was spilled, the gallant Finn slain in his home after Guthlaf and Osloth, back from their voyage, made old accusation. Their brutal ambush, the fate they had suffered, and blamed on Finn. The wildness in them had to brim over. A hall ran red with blood of enemies. Finn was cut down, the queen brought away, and everything the shilling should find 
Inside Finn's walls, the Frisian kings, gold collars and gemstones, swept off to the ship. Over sea lanes, then back to Daneland, the warrior troop bore that lady home. The poem was over. The poet had performed a pleasant murmur. Started on the benches, stewards did the rounds with wine and splendid jugs. And wealth and wheel, wheel Thiao came to sit in her gold crown between two good men, uncle and nephew, each one of whom still trusted the other. And the forthright unfirth, admired by all for his mind and courage, although under a cloud for killing his brothers, reclined near the king. The queen spoke. Enjoy this drink, my most generous lord. Raise up your goblet, entertain the geats, duly and gently. Discourse with them, be open-handed, happy and fond. Relish their company, but recollect as well all of the boons that have been bestowed on you. The bright court of Herat has been cleansed, and now the word is that you want to adopt this warrior as a son. So while you may, bask in your fortune, and then bequeath kingdom and nation to your kith and kin before you, your decease. I am certain of Hrothulf, Hroth, Hrothulf, he is noble and will use the young ones well. He will not let you down, should you die before him. He will treat our children truly and fairly. He will honor, I am sure, our two sons, repay them in kind when he recollects all the good things we gave him once, the favor and respect he found in his childhood. She turned then to the bench. She turned then to the bench where her boys sat, Brethric and Hrothmund, with other, other noble sons. All the youth together, and that good man, Balwulf the Great, sat between the brothers. The cup was carried to him, kind words, spoken in welcome, and a wealth of rock gold, graciously dis bestowed. Two arm bangles, a male shirt and rings, and the most resplendent torque of gold I have ever heard of, anywhere on earth or under heaven. There was no hoard like it since Hama snatched the brazing's neck chain and bore it away with its gems and settings to its shining to a shining fort, away from Eormenric's wiles and hatred, and there ensured his eternal reward. Hyslik the Geat, grandson of Swerting, wore his wore this neck ring on his last raid. At bay under his banner he defended the booty treasure he had won. Fate swept him away because of his proud need to provoke a feud with the Frisians. He fell beneath a shield in the same gem-crusted kingly gear he had worn when he crossed the frothing wave vat. So the dead king fell into Frankish hands. They took his breast mail, also his neck torque, and punier warriors plundered the slain. When the carnage ended, geat corpses covered the field. Applause filled the hall. Then Wheel Thiao pronounced in the presence of the company, Take delight in this torque, dear Beowulf. Wear it for luck and wear also this mail from our people's armor. May you prosper in them. Be acclaimed for strength, for ki kindly guidance to these two boys, and your bounty will be sure. You have won renown. You are known to all men, far and near, now and forever. Your sway is wide as the wind's home, as the sea around cliffs, and so, my prince, I wish you a lifetime of luck and blessings to enjoy this treasure. Treat my sons with tender care, be strong and kind. Here each comrade is true to the other, loyal to lord, loving in spirit. The thanes have one purpose, the people are ready. Having drunk and pledged, the ranks do as I bid. She moved then to her place, men were drinking wine, at that rare feast. How could they know fate, the grim shape of things to come, the threat looming over many thanes as night approached and King Hrothgar prepared to retire to his quarters? Retainers in great numbers were posted on guard, and so often in the past, benches were pushed back, bedding gear and bolsters spread across the floor, and one man lay down to his rest, already marked for death. 
At their hands they placed polished timber, battle shields, and on the bench above them, each man's kit was wet, was kept to hand. A towering war helmet, webbed shirt mail, and a great and great shafted spear. It was their habit always and everywhere to be ready for action. At home or in the camp, in whatever case and at whatever time they need arose, to rally around their lord. They were a right people. <sighs> Another attack. They went to sleep, and one paid dearly for his night's ease. As he had happened to them often, ever since Grendel occupied the Gold Hall, committing evil until the end came, death after his crimes. <clears throat> then it became clear, obvious to everyone once the fight was over, that the Avenger lurked and was still alive, grimly biding time. Grendel's mother, monstrous Hellbride, brooded on her wrongs. She had been forced down into fearful waters, the cold depths, after Cain had killed his father's son, felled his own brother with a sword. Brandon an outlaw marked by having murdered, he moved into the wilds, shunned company and joy, and from Cain there sprang misbegotten spirits, among them Grendel, the banished and accursed, due to come to grips with that watcher and Herot awaiting to do battle. The monster wretched, wrenched and wrestled with him, but Beowulf was mindful of his mighty strength, the wondrous gifts God had showered on him. He relied, relied for help on the Lord of all, on his care and favor. So he overcame the foe, brought down the hell brute, broken and bowed, broken and bowed, outcast from all sweetness, enemy of, enemy of mankind made for his death then. But now his mother had sallied forth on a savage journey, grief-wracked and ravenous, desperate for revenge. She came to Herat, there inside the hall, Danes lay asleep, earls who would soon endure a great reversal, once Grendel's mother attacked and entered. Her onslaught was less only by as much as an Amazon warrior's strength is less than an armed man's when the hefted sword, its hammered edge, and gleaming blade slathered in blood, raises the sturdy boar ridge of off a, off a helmet. In the hall, hard-honed swords were grabbed from the bench, many a broad shield lifted and braced. There was little thought of helmets or woven mail when they woke in terror. The hell dam was in panic, desperate to get out. In mortal terror, the moment she was found, she had pounced and taken one of the retainers in a tight hold, and headed for the fen. To Hrothgar, this man was the most beloved of the friends he trusted between the two seas. She had done away with a great warrior, ambushed him at rest. Beowulf was elsewhere. Earlier, after the award of the treasure, the geese had been given another lodging. There was an uproar in Herot. She had snatched the trophy, Grindel's bloodied hand. It was a fresh blow to the afflicted bond. The bargain was hard, both parties having to pay. <clears throat> 